There. What's up, everybody? My name is Indy, and this is Indie Game Business. That guy way over there, that's Jay. And in the middle, we have John File. And what what is your what what is your deal? Your licensing consultant expert? What is that? All right. Yeah, I'm uh, a. Uh, I've spent the last years uh, working on uh, um, a Wizard of the Coast uh, licensing stuff, nice. but uh, I still retain all of my knowledge. But so, still retain all of so. my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And John has been. I I didn't even realize how much stuff you had done until you know you sent me your your ludography which that's a new word for me i, I was oh, i always referred to them as softographies mm -hmm. but you know you go all the way back to the early days of lucas arts and you know you were a designer on forza and the uh what was the other one the other one at, at microsoft flight simulator, flight simulator. i was yeah, also on, uh, mythica the mmo yeah for there, you have been doing a, a ton of awesome stuff for years, but you mm -hmm. know, most recently you were, and I'm, I'm not going to be completely facetious about this. One of my favorite people to meet with at the conferences, you know, year in and year out, because one, you're just an awesome guy. And two, you, you have all this knowledge and insight and three, you always had like a little bit of, you know, D and D swag for me, you know, <laughs> but it's, you're one of the folks, you know, in the industry that I, I don't know, I, I refer to them as the, the unsung heroes, you know, you're out there, you know, fighting the good fight, but it's not like your name that's constantly in the news on, on some of these games. And so, right. you know, it's, it's great to be able to have you on here and just tap into a bit of that knowledge. And so, you know, for everyone out there, if you've got, you know, questions, if you've got, you know, things you want us to talk about or questions for John, you know, obviously he can't go into like NDA material on, on anything. Um, but yeah, toss them up in chat. Let us know. Uh, but John, why don't you start at the beginning? How did you get into this industry? Because that's always an interesting story for everyone being is there's not like a, a normal way any of us started doing this. But how did you get into the industry, and then walk us through our walk us through your career and, and all the stuff that you've done over the years? Yeah, I find myself walking my uh, myself through my career a lot. I'm not sure how that happens, but um, <laughs> uh, so all right, uh, I'll start at the beginning. So, so in high school, um, I I fell in love with Dungeons and Dragons. So, so um, I lived in rural Nevada uh, on a farm, and uh, so uh, I read voraciously, but D&D &D didn't come to me until the 80s, right? And, um, and, and so I fell in love with, with role-playing games and, and all sorts of, uh, of those types of brands, uh, the D&Ds, the Role Masters, the Rune Quest, the Call of Cthulhu's, the Champions, the Vig Villains of Vigilantes, all that stuff. So, so uh, and that became kind of a firm part of who I was, part of my psyche, is, is game design, game development uh, on, on the pen and paper level. I always, always wanted to get into that, that, uh, that business. But, but uh, after the 80s, that business kind of fell apart. It's really, really for dedicated hobbyists. I think the, um, there are only a very few people that, that can really like make a living at, at, at being that, that kind of designer. Um, in the 90s, uh, I um, uh, I ended up picking up Ultima Online. You guys played Ultima Online, right? Back mm -hmm. in the day. Uh, and I realized that uh, um, video games had finally gone to a spot that it could tell the stories that I wanted to tell. That 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 video games could 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 you know really reflect the things that I really really want to do in in terms of games. And so so I went back to my wife. I was working at MCI Worldcom as a sound engineer. I said, Gene, I really want to get into games. And she said, what? And so, <laughs> um, uh, so I had a friend uh, from high school whose fiance was um, uh, an, a, a lead artist at LucasArts. And so um, I talked to her and, um, and she said that uh, he mentioned that there was some open QA positions. 
Uh, and so I went for it and I took a huge, huge cut in pay um, and and became uh, a QA uh, tester for LucasArts games right when episode one was about to launch. And so my very first game that I worked on was Podracer, not Star Wars Podracer. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, and then I, I QA'd for about a year and a level design position uh, came open and um, I, I, I went and took the, the level design position for this, uh, Battle for Naboo. It was based on the Rogue Squadron engine. And, um, and I had like 101 degree temperature that day. And I don't even remember what I did, but I, I ended up getting a design position. And so, so uh, I was at LucasArts for about four years doing mostly Star Wars game stuff. Uh, and then um, I moved from LucasArts after about four years to Microsoft uh, to work on Mythica, which was an MMO that got canceled. It was a uh, Norse-based, um, you played uh, uh, a, uh, a child of the Norse gods, basically, um, running around uh, all the, the nine realms. That, that, would, that would have been kind of fun. It was super pretty game. Um, and then, uh, then I... Uh, that ended up getting canceled with that whole transition between Ed Freeze and Shane, mm -hmm. and so, uh, and um, and so I managed to jump onto Forza Motorsport. I worked on Forza Motorsport and did uh, um, did that for a while, and then I jumped on to Flight Simulator 10, and so, um, uh, and that was super interesting, and completely outside of my my general scope of, of of knowledge, uh, although Forza really tested that as well because I'm not a car guy either. And then I moved to uh, um, Snowblind Entertainment. I worked on a uh, Justice League Heroes game, um, and so worked on a DC license there. So at, at that point, uh, I had worked on uh, Star Wars, and now I'm working on DC. And then I moved to Amaze Entertainment where I worked on a Wolverine title and a Spider-Man title. I was lead designer on a Spider-Man title. Um, and I worked a little bit on uh, Princess and the Frog um, title that they, they were making. So I added uh, uh, Marvel and Disney to the licenses that I, I worked on. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, uh, then uh, by that time, the financial crash happened. I spent uh, like uh, two years like trying to find work uh, and you know getting a little contract job here and a, a little game job there and and uh, did some Facebook game stuff and then I landed uh, in 2010 my job at uh, Wizards of the Coast I've worked on uh, D&D uh, for the bulk of that time and added Magic the Gathering and um, and Avalon Hill properties and and uh, um, and Duel Masters uh, while I was there and so that brings me up to date you, you uh, during have that time, completely covered the geek world. I I have touched a lot of stuff, and then then uh, concurrently, I, I also uh, um, was part of the IGDA board directors for about five years. It's like two thousand three, two thousand eight. There, and there's um, a question in chat. Someone says, uh, "Flippo says those are really different kinds of games. All level editor jobs was is the question." <laughs> Uh, so um, the uh, um, uh, uh, so for level design, uh, hopefully uh, we're talking about that. Uh, so so with with Lucas Arts, um, uh, uh, every single game that I worked on within Lu Lucas Arts, every team had a different solution on how to build games. So I was on. Uh, I had to learn. It, um, so uh, at at one point, I taught taught uh, game design at, at DigiPen. And so, uh, and uh, the strongest skill that you can have as a level designer is an ability to pick up new level design tools because everybody has a different thing that they want you to use. So at LucasArts, I had um, uh, like the Rogue Squadron um, editor that Factor 5 came up with. Uh, and then um, I moved on to another proprietary level uh, design engine that uh, on Jedi Starfighter, and then yet another um, proprietary level design, uh, level level editor that that implemented Maya, um, and uh, I think Lua, 
um, in order to do uh, a level design on uh, the uh, the canceled uh, full throttle two um, that I worked on. Uh, and then moving on to uh, um, Microsoft, the Forza, Forza guys, they did all their level editing on the Xbox. So I wasn't even on a computer. I was really stuff on the, on the Xbox. Um, and that was that was super weird uh, using a controller to uh, um, uh, to do uh, to the level design there uh, with with um, that was that was super interesting. They'd never done missions before Flight Simulator 10, and so uh, the uh, the initial uh, level editor that they gave us was Visio. So so um, you know what Visio is, right? It's this flowchart oh, yeah. software. Um, so, uh, and basically there's just like, um, uh, you know, Unreal uses this a little bit in terms of its Kismet stuff, uh, is, um, uh, you know, you build little boxes of code and you connect them to other boxes of code, uh, and, uh, and then you try to make a, a mission out of that. And that, that was horrendous. And eventually they gave us a more of a real mission editor as basis based in the engine. And that was super, super helpful. Uh, Snowblind, uh, they had a huge um, run with the same engine. It was all a tile-based, uh, a little bit like um, the Infinity engine from, uh, or uh, no, the Aurora engine from Neverwinter. I always thought it was the same engine. Uh, so, um, no, no, so the Aurora engine and the Snowblind engine, very, very similar, all tile-based, um, all ISO um, third-person camera. Uh, and you just uh, blick block them all into into places, and um, uh, and then you set up the scripts and and plug things down. Super super uh, easy by that time. They'd used it on uh, Baldur's Gate Dark, Dark Alliance, uh, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance Two, uh, the EverQuest games they did. Do you remember that they did like um, Champions uh -huh. of the Wrath and stuff like that? Yeah. And um, and then the last game that they used it on was the Justice League game, Justice League Heroes game I worked on. And then uh, Amaze, when I went over to Amaze, um, that was a uh, uh, their own proprietary engine. I think it was called the Inferno engine, I think. Um, and, uh, oh, man, that was... So th the thing about Amaze was they were a licensing house. They were uh, a game developer that, that did just licenses for... licensed games for publishers. And so... In general, what their job was was to fill in the gaps of um, of all the platforms that the game was supposed to go on that the primary teams didn't want to like work on. So their engine was kind of like Unity in the fact that it was supposed to export to PSP, PS2, uh, original Xbox, um, Xbox 360, uh, PS3, um, and, uh, huge amounts of of uh, PC. And um, and so the problem with engines like that, especially at that time, was you ended up making games that um, this link of the of the uh, of the platforms you were supposed to go out on, right? So so um, uh, if you were going to go out on PS3 and you're also going to go out on PSP, and PSP had much uh, worse. Um, you know, resolution and uh, frame rate while you were designing for the PSP and then then hopefully doing a little bit of uprising and stuff for PS3. But but uh, that meant that the level sizes were really small. The amount of, of uh, active AI characters within the levels were really, really small. Uh, it, was, it was a super challenging uh, uh, engine to work with. Uh, Facebook, of course, not a lot of level uh, editing. And then at Wizards, I, I uh, moved into a more business position. Uh, like we talked about, and so, so I, I haven't actually done any uh, serious level design since uh, since uh, Maze, really. So, you know, and, and we got through one question before. I'm going to throw us off on a tangent. What I mean, you've worked with so many engines and types of games, and you know what you have to do from the design to implementing the licenses to, uh, you know, understanding what platforms it's going to go for i have seen many much less internal engines as i used to see 
Mm-hmm. Where yeah. do you what what do you see? What do you for the in, for the developers that are out there? And you know, I, I wouldn't personally recommend somebody jumping in and going. Our first game is going to be on our internal engine because that's just super super dangerous. But right. what do you think? What's the pros and cons between you know an Unreal or a Unity versus you know some of these other internal engines that you that you've worked with? So um, the uh, that, that's a, a super good question, and it's mostly about efficiency, right? So um, when you have your own internal engine, I'm not saying that anybody should ever use their internal you know, own internal <laughs> engine, which is different um, than we would have said ten or fifteen years ago. Uh, well, yeah, it's it's, uh, um, but when you use somebody else's solution, that solution is going to be general, just like I talked about with the weakest link. Uh, stuff, right? So when you're talking about uh, Unity or Unreal, um, do you remember when uh, Sony decided to use Unreal to do DC Universe, the MMO? No. And no one had ever, uh, no one had ever used Unreal as an MMO, uh, MMO engine before. And <laughs> the, thing, the thing shipped, what, two years late, something like that? Yes. Um, be- because they basically had to rewrite the Unreal engine to be able to, to do all that network code. And the uh, uh, the thing is, is that Unreal is the same. Uh, Unreal is the same now, um, and uh, Unity is the same now. It's, it's not going to be specific to the needs of your game. It's going to be general to the the needs of your game. And so, if you want to do something off the radar, like um, I worked on a, a title uh, that used Unity, and they decided to bring it onto console. And Unity at that time for console was wasn't optimal experience um and so so the frame rate problems and 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 all sorts of stuff and support wasn't there um and now it, and now I, i'm sure it's just better this years ago um but uh uh the uh um uh that the, the that's the the definite problem if you use like native code especially for mobile um devices and and you program from the metal up uh you know you're going to get a super efficient highly optimized um uh you know platform for you to be able to do the things that you want to do with your game uh especially if that game is doing something that no one's ever done before doing like a story game or like an object game or or you know a platform of some uh sort where many 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 people have have used uh, those engines for those types of uh of games uh you're going to end up with you know kind of kind of a 90 90 percent solution or 95 percent solution yeah. and you're going to find some edge case that you're going oh my god i can't believe that the engine doesn't do this thing or or there's some mysterious bug that you can't figure out that uh that you have to kind of work around instead of address uh and uh but but yeah uh, definitely the cost savings of just going with unity or or unreal paying the licensing fee later on is uh so so much more optimal uh than than trying to roll your own uh and and having your own engine that that is is super effective to the game that you want that there's there's a very hard comparison there well and you can get support that theoretically you shouldn't need a ton of support if you're doing your own engine but you know it is nice to be able to call on you know experts there and and, you know like Div said there's we have to recognize there's a difference between i want to build an engine because i want to learn and i want to you know put something out on the market that i hope is going to make money you know there's you definitely a difference there we're talking about you know if you want to do something that actually generates revenue you know in in this sort of thing so um Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about you know some of the IP that you've worked with, and you know it's funny that you mentioned a maze is like is a or was a uh, an IP house because I ran one of those myself for three years, and I know very well how how those deals go sometimes. But, yeah, you know, for developers out there, and and this is one of the things you did at Wizards is come people would come pitch you ideas. It's like I have this game, but I want to put it you know in you know, the Forgotten Realms or, or 
you know, I don't know, Dragonlance, which man, Tom, mm-hmm. I'm still I'm still disappointed you, you you never got me a Dragonlance game, but I'm not gonna okay. hold that against you. Okay. So what should a developer be looking for when they're going and, and, and starting that search for an IP? Oh, it's, this uh, unboxes uh, a lot of stuff. Um, you know, when when we start talking about doing this this talk, you know, I start thinking about that. And and the very first thing that that I would caution you against is for you know you just put together your company. Um, a, a license really isn't for you. So this is, is basically the, the the plain thing there. So um, uh, a licensor. Uh, has two reasons why they want to do video games with their their license, uh, and um, and in general is to expand the brand, but it's also to to reach audiences that that uh, um, uh, that they normally wouldn't wouldn't reach. And um, and then that that's that's kind of one side, and the other side is basically taking advantage of. Um, uh, of an audience that might want to to um, interact with the brand in a different way. So, so the, the, those two two types of of thoughts. I know that that's all kind of cloudy and, and mixed up, but but it really comes down to the license being either for adults or for kids. Um, and so, so with um, kids licenses, uh, generally uh, based off of movies. Uh, or other entertainment, um, uh, popular books, things like that, toys possibly, and those uh, those are aims, uh, you know, uh, with the idea of not the kid buying the game, but the parent buying the game, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, it used to be, you know, back in the '90s and early early 2000s, that parents weren't very what was a good video game and what was not a video a good video game and that's changing of course as the, the general population becomes more and more and more and more familiar with video games but but in general if you put out a door of the explorer um uh video game you now a kid wasn't buying that you know the, the the adult was the adult wasn't caring about whether uh it was a good dora the explorer game or a bad dora the explorer game they were only caring about either uh, appeasing the, the the child and getting them the game that they wanted, or buying a game for them because they got a new console or a new uh, you know handheld, something like that, and and they they trusted the brand uh, to be safe for their child, right? So there there wasn't a lot of quality concerns there. And then you basically for, slapped well, a license on another game that you had laying around, and because parents knew the license, they would buy the game. Exactly. And, yep. And so, so for for those types of games, there are, are specific developers like Amaze and and the one that you helped run uh, that uh, um, uh, that were were very much experienced in 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 doing those kinds of things. So you 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 talked with Tobias a couple of weeks ago, I guess, and and he, he kind of covered uh, this a little bit in in what not to do with licenses, and uh, and the uh, th- those types of games like Amaze. They would have really hard development periods where they would have to ship a game uh, specifically um, on, on time in nine months or twelve months or fourteen months or sixteen months, depending on on the, the generosity of the publisher and, and the time frame. They're smaller. They had less quality. You know the the golden triangle. You can have it good, cheaper, fast. Pick two. Um, uh, so and everybody won cheap and fast. So. So uh, you uh, um, you ended up with the lesser quality games, but they were aimed at at, at little, little kid. And, and uh, the reason you know, for those for those of you who are wondering why, and and it's because we got to keep in mind, John, you and I have been doing this a very long time, and so things that we take for granted, other folks may not. But you had to focus your license at who was who had the money mom and dad have the money grandparents have the money you know that's why you know you would do dora or sesame street or Mm -hmm. something along those lines i had jack shit to do with the quality of the game you know there was an expectation by the parents that it wouldn't completely and utterly suck but that's not always the case and 
you know, Div just brought up a good a good point in you know in chat about the, the children's games. There are awesome things that you can teach in a game to kids, but the reality of the market is unless you slap a license on it, it's going to be hard. And now it's even worse because you've got these big behemoths out there like ABC and there's another one that my son, you know, uses at school. And so mm. when you're looking at that kid's property, it's not always about what makes the best sense for the game. It's about right. know, what, what do mom and dad recognize? Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, an interesting um, uh, deviation is serious games with licenses. It's a totally different discussion. Um, uh, but, uh, but certainly you can, you can make a serious game, uh, you know, a game that that's educational, uh, and, um, and meant to be educational, uh, with a license like, uh, like Kaplan, right. Mm -hmm. Um, something of that sort. Uh, and then, uh, then, then there's, uh, you know, uh, licenses that appeal to adults like Game of Thrones or, or um, you know, D and D or White Wolf Games or any number of, of other things, and those um, those are sold to an audience that that uh, notices quality and um, is very much cognizant of it. So, so um, uh, so those those require a whole different thought process. You know, you can't you can't be uh, um, shirking on the quality, or else you won't. The, the license doesn't help you know a good example is is um is comic book games really kind of filling that that middle space right between kids and adults and so um you know the 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 license that everybody talks about with uh um with despair i guess is superman right so uh, no one's ever made a, a good superman game um and uh which i don't have a problem and, with because i can't stand superman <laughs> and so the uh uh the the uh the thing there is that they put like that that kid level um uh process on that license but the people that are really judging it are the adults the adult fans of superman and so so that's uh um uh, that that's the 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 problem there in in terms of of going for the more adult audiences, you have to make a, a really coherent game that that really really respects the license and and respects the audience and uh, knows exactly what they want, tries to deliver that experience to them. And uh, and so um, yeah, that that's uh, uh, that that's kind of difference there. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of stuff going on in my head. So why don't, why don't you go with another question? That, that, that's what I said, you know, if we get through, you know, two or three of the questions that, that I send you before the show, I'm happy because we tend to go off on all these different, you know, tangents anyway. So, all right. right. So you're, you're a developer and you figured out, you know, what you think you need in terms of, a, of an IP. So how do you go about actually getting it? All right. Okay, so uh, so thing that a licensor will look at um, uh, in terms of a developer is has the developer executed on this game type before, right? So so um, uh, if you're a new developer, I you know it's, it's you, you got you and your best uh, forty friends together and and uh, built a development house or or four friends or what have you. Uh, and haven't shipped anything yet to see you as a risk and they're not going to, to, to go with you because the purpose uh, on the licensor side is to make sure that they're of good quality and will sell well and respect the license. And so if you haven't, if you don't have something that you've executed on that's within that, that, that genre, that, uh, um, uh, that the licensor can be pretty sure that you can execute on, then, then the licensor is going to kind of pass you by. So, so uh, uh, certainly, many, many times I was contacted by small developers who had great idea. They they were, um, you know, wanted to get into the the game industry. They saw like uh, an edge case IP that 
that uh, that that we owned um, uh, and said, hey, I haven't seen a game like this since the SSI days. Can can me and my team go and execute on this and 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 uh, license license that out? And uh, in many many cases, uh, the the game would be so niche or small or um, there'd be uh, so little so little um, ROI involved in it that that uh, um, that it just wasn't wasn't worth board with that no um, <coughs> dragon lance it's uh, i'm not talking about dragon lance <laughs> um, so so uh so that, that that's the first thing right is as as an indie, indie developer um uh, you need to have you need to have experience doing the thing that you're proposing so that you have proof that you're not a risk so that's that's the the second thing that lecture is going to look at um you know, is 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 that ROI, right? Is is are you coming forward with with something that's going to sell fifty thousand copies, or or is only going to be making you know, you know maybe five hundred thousand uh, dollars in its first year or something like that? And uh, after after platform fees and after uh, your own costs and after royalties and stuff, no one's making any money. Um, uh, then the licensor is, is going to, to kind of pass on that. So the, the more niche uh, you you want to, to go, uh, the, the harder it is to, to get a licensor to, to, to look at you. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't licensors out there that are willing to take a chance. But usually, the more likely they want to take a chance, the smaller that license is. Like I remember back, uh, back when I was still living in California, I had a friend um met the guy who owned the gumby ip huh. uh you know gumby right yeah. uh and, and uh and so he was going to every developer he could think of going hey you want to make a gumby game why don't you make a gumby game for me it would be great to make a gumby game and uh no one was going for it for some reason right so so I'm sure that some of you guys out there probably go wow gumby would be a fun game to make but but uh um uh in general uh, the IP isn't super, super, super powerful, um, and so uh, so the 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 reason that you would want to have that as a license is is less compelling. So um, uh, just just to kind of deviate a little bit, the reason that you'd want to license is is uh, you know to use 2018 talk, it's um, uh, you know it's all about the UA, right? The user acquisition. So a license reduces your user acquisition costs. And so uh, going in and getting a license like a Game of Thrones or um, you know, a Dark Tower license or something like that, uh, that means that the price to acquire a new user is less on the average because you're going to get a bunch of users for free who wants to want to check out that license. Um, Another reason that you want a license is that um, you will generally get a, a a better advantage on getting noticed by different platforms, right? So you might end up finding out that um, the the guys at Apple or the guys at Android or the guys at Steam um, are fans of the, the the IP that you're building a game on, and they might give you a break or they might give you some uh, more free notice uh, uh some better placement things like that because of the ip uh and the licensor uh you know the bigger the licensor the more they're already engaged with those platforms the more they're already talking to to the, those people now uh, around the other games that they're doing and they can help a developer reach out to those platforms and and talk about when they're going to release and 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 uh, what kind of opportunities there are and uh, getting a better release window and things like that. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, definitely, that's really the reason why you want to use a license is because of that would be back to the uh, and that, that better placement and, and more noticeability. And in today's age of really, really, really crowded marketplaces and shelf spaces on like the App Store or on Steam, where there's a quintillion games and you just can't you 
you know, uh, a, a buyer comes in and gets immediately overwhelmed by how much stuff there is to download and 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 choose from. Having somebody something that they recognize is uh, is invaluable in 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 uh, attracting users. So it's that uh, once again that user acquisition cost um, uh, reduction that 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 is the the real drive of of using a license. I mean, and you've also got a situation where, especially when dealing something like comic books or you know D and D, Magic the Gathering, something along those lines, you don't necessarily have to create your own world anymore. You've got just metric tons of material that you can pull from that right. you know makes it that much you know easier on you as a developer. That's a that's a good thought that um, I don't think is as strong as uh, I may have once have thought it is. And, oh, really? Uh, the the uh, um, reason for that is is uh, the, the more uh, the stronger the IP that that you have, the more of a box you end up having to work within, right? So so yeah, it gives you a lot of um, uh, a backstory for a character, but it also means that the character can't go outside that that barrier. Right. Um, so I remember uh, one conversation I had with a uh, um, uh, with a studio head who wanted to do a Batman game, but he's going, "Okay, so let's have Batman have guns, right? So he can shoot people." And uh, and like all of us big comic book geeks are going, "What? And it's what? That's that's the whole thing about Batman is that he doesn't use guns, and that's that's uh, loosened up a lot since uh, since the the time that we had that conversation. But but uh, the uh, um, no the point there is is that there, there's there's this box that you you can't uh, uh, get beyond, and um, uh, and that that box includes um, character characterizations and characteristics. There's a lot of art style considerations that that uh, you have to, to bend towards, um, uh, and uh, and so um, with the industry being so filled with highly highly creative developers and and designers, um, uh, you know I'm every third designer that I know can build a world within three weeks, right? <laughs> so. So um, uh, you know that that's that's certainly not not the hard part is coming up with characters and coming up with settings and coming up with and and things like that. Uh, so the, the the real strength of the license I don't really feel is is all that made to order um, uh, narrative and and design stuff because because a good designer can can rebuild that for for anybody in in you know the time it takes to make the game that is super interesting because i had not thought of it i mean i'm, I'm used to having to work within those boxes i mean we talked on another episode about getting the the big bible that had things you can't let dora do and i'm like mm -hmm. well now i just want to make dora do those things yeah but, you yeah. know it is you know that that's an interesting point and and the good designers can do that stuff, you know. And if not, quite frankly, I know this from from my D and D days. There's websites you can go that will like auto generate random stories for you. Because um, awesome. I've used some of those when I played Skyrim and Fallout, and you know, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I need a new character to RP that I have no idea. So, I mean, there are opportunities like that. So it's it's um, that's very that that is very interesting. Right. I, yeah, I know, but my D and D crew is like scattered to the winds, and and we haven't all adopted the the internet version of D and D yet. So right. I haven't been able to play it on a long time. But I have kids, and we will soon be, you know, tackling that. Mm -hmm. right, so when you're, what are some of the what are some of the traps you have to look out for? What are some of the warning signs, the red flags? that you need to look out for and be aware of, you know, through this whole IP process? Uh, all right. So um, uh, there's, uh, so the the most danger 
uh, generally is a licensor that doesn't know anything about the video game industry. And so uh, it takes for granted that the things they can imagine can be done in the, 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 the video game, right? Uh, and uh, so, so uh, you know, role-playing games are a, a good, uh, good, good uh, um, example. So let's say that um, you're going to be making a Sky Realms of Jeroen um, uh, video game using the Sky Realms of Jeroen RPG that came out in the 80s. Uh, and um, you go to the, the Sky Realms of Jeroen the designer, the, the people who own the, the IP, and, and you say, all right, we're going to make a, a video game. They go, great, let's do that. And so you go, you start making it. And then the, the, the designer who's used to working in a pen and paper environment where, you know, if you want to uh, make a giant desert uh, in the middle of this continent, all you have to do is there is a giant desert in the middle of this continent. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, and they come to you and say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we put a giant desert in the middle of this continent that you've been building? Um, they're not going to understand the scope of their, their request. <laughs> um, and uh, and I've, I've dealt with, with big licensors that, that um, have done the same thing, that, that just don't understand the, the scope of, of what they've, they ask. It's like, oh, we'd like, um, uh, we'd like the game to understand what date it is and always you know, a reinvent itself for that date. So if it's Halloween, suddenly there's pumpkins everywhere. And if it's Christmas, there's Christmas stuff everywhere. And if it's Easter, there's Easter stuff everywhere. Um, and if it's 4th of July, it's 4th of July everywhere. <laughs> um, and, and you know, you're nodding your head going, those are like four different games, right? It's, it's there, There's so much more art that you have to make, so much more planning that you have to do. And if it's like a, a single one and done like fire and forget type of game, all those assets have to be in the game at ship, right? So it's not like an MMO where you have three months to prepare for Halloween to get all the, you know, pumpkins on, you know, every single surface that you could possibly get a pumpkin on. Um, and so so uh, uh, that that's the thing that you really have to worry about is, is licensors really, really don't understand the scope of the, their requests. <laughs> And, I'm and, laughing because I've had those same exact conversations. <laughs> right. And, like, and I think that everybody who, who's worked in this space understands that, right? Is is just these sweeping requests that, um, that you know, like I said, all it takes is somebody to write a sentence on a, a piece of paper and, hey, it's there in their, their imagination space. But that one sentence is, uh, you know, Thousands and thousands of man hours of, of modeling and texturing and, mo and and animation and rigging and design and coding and um, it's just it's, it's just crazy. It's just one sentence can do that. And so so those are the th that, that's one thing that you have to worry about. Um, uh, and uh, uh, some licensors will will be a lot more intrusive in terms of it, their their oversight on what's happening in your game and want to check in a lot. Um, you know, they'll want to see every single art asset to make sure that the art assets are, are, um, uh, are, you know, respecting the brand. And so, uh, pipelines will be generate, uh, need to generate it, uh, be needed to generate it. There's a lot of ads in that, um, will need to be generated. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, in order for you, to be able to do that. And that will change your entire um, methodology of building things, right? So so um, when, I, uh, when I was doing licensing uh, as the licensor, the things that I would ask for is I would want to see art in its most simple form, right? Just uh, a sketch. You know, it doesn't even have to be colored. Um, it doesn't have to be fully concepted. Just show me your dragon or show me whatever. Uh, and and then let us talk about it back and forth so that we get the initial thought right. And then you can go into full concepting and, and full modeling and stuff like that. So the, the difficulty with that is if you have a bank of artists uh, that are all building that or you're doing outsourced uh, art, um, uh, you know, and you're going to China or, um, you know, India or something like that to get your art done. 
uh, this uh, this stuff is going to slow you down tremendously. And so that's something to think about when you, you're using a, a, a license that that wants a lot of touch points in terms of its oversight in, in, in your game. Um, uh, another thing to think about uh, is, are you dealing with the licensor or are you de dealing with a publisher who's re representing the licensor? And so, uh, like, if you're going to be doing, say, a Harry Potter um, uh, game, there are, like, four or five entities that you have to deal with, right? There's there's um, the publisher that uh, that um, is, is helping you make the game. So let's say that you're working with EA to build a Harry Potter game. So uh, EA is going to be your, your basic touch point, but um, uh, if EA has the movie rights for a game and not the book rights for the game, um, uh, what will happen is the uh, um, uh, uh, you'll have to report to EA and you'll have to report to Warner Brothers, um, who owns the Harry Potter uh, film rights, and then you'll have to pay... Uh, um, report to JK Rowling as well. And hopefully the publisher has those all wrapped up um, and uh, in sync, but uh, very frequently you'll send something out to EA and um, it'll seem fine, it'll seem fine, it'll be seem fine, and then it'll get rejected later on and you won't understand why. And uh, the, the, the reason for that is that it finally made its way to one of the other responsible parties and somebody finally managed to find the time to review it and you know jk rowling said wait a minute you know harry potter isn't blonde or something like that <laughs> so um uh so the uh um uh so that that's yet another difficulty is is uh, uh especially you know in that amaze space that we talked about uh that was that you know, when you're doing we have a dev house that is doing specifically licensed material for publishers, and those are super rare now. Um, you end up with with all these owners that are trying to uh, um, uh, to dig into your your uh, uh, business and and um, and make you make that uh, the game the way you want to do it. But conversely, um, if you're working for a publisher, that means you're getting paid to develop. Uh, rather than seeking out a license uh, like a Skyrim's of Druun thing and then paying for the development yourself. And so so uh, at least you know that you know you can pay your people and you can pay yourself um, when you're working with a publisher. So the you're absolutely right about the different levels of approvals that you have to get into, which is why you have to factor that into your development schedule, you have to put, you know, contract clauses in there that say, I mean, we, the, the clause that we use when we're dealing with a lot of licenses basically says, when we send you something, you have two to three weeks, depending on who it is, to review mm -hmm. it. And if you don't approve it, it's automatically approved. And that's not going to get you out of every situation, but it's at least going to put something in the contract that you can hold them to because in the real world, what's going to happen is you're going to send that to them. They're not going to get it done in two or three weeks, but mm -hmm. you're going to move forward ahead anyway. And then they're going to start complaining, you know, that the game is late. And then you can at least look and go, well, it's because you take us a month and a half to get back to us on all of these things that we need to prove. Right. But, you know, when we were doing, you know, you know when, I, when I was running the production company and we started doing our own internal titles, we knew that we needed an IP. And I mm -hmm. knew how all of this stuff worked. So instead of we were going, we were working with a, you know, a New York best time best-selling author. Instead of going to her publisher, I went directly to her agent, and that effectively, because that agency and, and that author had enough sense to retain the game rights to the book we didn't mm -hmm. have to get involved with the publisher and deal with all of that. Now, whether or not that's going to work for anything just depends on the license, but you know, there are ways to get around to some of that, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you're, you are beholden to whatever that licensor wants and mm -hmm. you, you know, the approvals are going to take however long they take. Right. So, yeah. you know, 
with all of the partnerships that you've seen, you know, the ones that made it, the ones that didn't make it, you know, talk about the ones that you've seen be the most successful and, and why did they go that well? Okay. Uh, so um, uh, I have dogs. You probably hear them. We all have, um, dogs. We all have dogs. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, apparently someone is walking, uh, walking a dog through the neighborhood without permit. So, yes. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, I swear these, these neighbors How are walking. They? I know they're walking the past my house, the unpermitted dog, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, abominable behavior really um so uh so the uh um all right so so i have a whiteboard so i am going to use my whiteboard see my whiteboard can you see my whiteboard this is my whiteboard so um uh so I, i've given a lot of thought about this and so so the uh, um uh the the first uh thing that um that makes successful IP game is that it reflects the IP in the best way possible, right? And so, so because that that is when uh, that is when you acquire the most of the fans that love the IP. So um, if you make something that is uh, outside the pale of of what they expect the IP to be able to do then you're not going to grab as many of those core fans as that you want. And thus, your user acquisition costs are going to go up. Do you mean something like so, a uh, Charlie Brown first-person shooter battle royale? That probably wouldn't go over uh, very well. Uh, so um, uh, Charlie Brown RTS or Charlie Brown 4X game. Yeah. Right? Ooh, so, um, I want to play a Charlie Brown 4X game. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> I'm sure you and six other people will really enjoy that game. <laughs> Um, you always uh, use that uh, argument against me, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's 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 not untrue. So so let's say, uh, so let's say that that uh, you have a target, right? A badly drawn target, and so the um, uh, so let's say that uh, you know let's go with my core experience. Let's say that uh, you're going to be building a um, uh, a Skyrim of Druun, um, uh video game, and so. So in, in the center, what people are expecting are is an RPG. Um, and so the farther you go out, you know, like say to that 4X game or to, um, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, a dating simulator or a farming simulator in, in Skyrim's of your realm, the less, the less you're going to, to benefit from the license that you're using. And so the most successful um, licensed games are the ones that um, really, really speak to the core of that uh, that experience. So, so the Mario Nintendo racing game was just kind of a fluke then, because so that, um, that was like so, totally outside the realm of. Right. Well, so the the other aspect is that if you can get a license that has already been in video games then um, you are acquiring a wholly different audience than that core, um, uh, that other type of core uh, audience, right? So Mario Brothers is a video game license, right? So people are expecting Mario to be part of, um, uh, of you know, a video game experience. So uh, rather than Charlie Brown, where you're picking up co uh, comic strip fans, not comic book fans, but comic strip fans, from newspapers and trying to convert them into a, a, a digital customer. Ah. And so you're going to get a lot of lossiness when you're, you're trying to go from that type of experience to the digital realm rather than a digital realm to another digital realm. Another um, benefit that Mario has is that Mario might as well just be named Nintendo, right? Because they're so inseparable. And so, uh, everybody knows uh, who who um, plays on Nintendo that uh, the Mario games are the best polished, the most thought out. Uh, you have uh, Shigeru uh, Miyamoto working on them, and so you you know to expect quality. So um, uh, in that realm, moving Mario into a different type of art, um, 
Nintendo experience, right? That's built specifically for your Nintendo device. You expect quality. So, so uh, the uh, um, the the point with with Mario is that that he's not signifying platformer. He's signifying Nintendo at its finest, right? Right. right. So putting him in a racing game, putting him into kind of that, that Ghostbusters type of experience. Um, or, you know, any other, uh, you know, putting them in Smash Brothers, yeah. uh, signifies that, that Nintendo really, really believe that the, uh, the game that, that, uh, Mario is going to be in is going to be of the utmost quality. Nice. And so, that's, that's, uh, Div- right? Divinorum says, just for the sake of creating some chaos, I want your opinion on Kingdom Hearts. Uh, so Kingdom Hearts is, is, uh, um, so one of the difficulties i have is i don't know any numbers on kingdom hearts right so i i know it that does well yeah so so it's um uh, it's certainly you know i think that the the original benefit of the original kingdom hearts was that it had disney characters in it right um uh so uh and that that drew some audience to it but I think that it's uh, Japanese JRPG um, aesthetic, um, uh, and the fact that it came out in that PS2 era, era where that aesthetic was was super super popular, um, uh, really really kind of cemented it, right? So so generally when I I see a, um, a Kingdom Hearts um, ad or commercial or anything like that, Disney plays a part of it, but it's really really not that like the center of the game now i think that kingdom hearts has built its own little ip empire um is like disney adjacent but not disney focused right uh and and so i think that uh in in that case uh it, it's super interesting also disney really really just kind of unlocked that box right that box that you have to play uh play in um i'm sure that they made sure that all those characters were treated uh, with respect and uh, had continuity with the the uh, experience that you wanted to have with, say, Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse or Goofy or whatever. Um, uh, but uh, you know, they unlock that whole setting box, right? Is the, the whole setting isn't Disney at all? It, it's it's Kingdom Hearts specific. Um, another game uh, that. Uh, that that comes to mind as a huge success in terms of a licensed game is is uh, Pokemon Go. And so, um, and that once again is also leveraging the fact that Pokemon has a really really strong association with quality video games, right? So so they already have an established video game audience for that brand. Like Call of Duty has an established video game audience, and Middle of Honor, and and um, and uh, you know Assassin's Creed, and and any other big video game IP. Pokemon established itself uh, in tandem uh, as both the card game and the um, the the Game Boy games, the, the platinum and the gold, and and, and uh, the diamond and the silver, and all that stuff. So, um, uh, so with Pokemon Go. You know that really, really strong, um, you know, uh, association with video games really, really helped to to pull people into Pokemon Go because they expected a certain level of quality. They expected a um, a, a lesser learning curve in terms of what they were supposed to be doing, uh, and uh, Pokemon Go really served up kind of a a very, very faithful um, uh, experience that you would expect from Pokemon in terms of catching Pokemon and going places and, and doing that stuff. So it really blended um, a lot of the aesthetic from the video games, from the cartoon and from the, the, the card game to, uh, um, to, to really, really knock it out of the park. You want to hear, the... hear something crazy? I've never sure. ever played a Pokemon game before ever. What? I never, I never played the card game. I never played the video game. I mean, I tried Pokemon Go, but that was it. Mm-hmm. I've never, ever, ever played a card game or watched a cartoon. I started the first one. Well, maybe it wasn't the first one. Actually, oh, ban Indy. That's rude. Ban <laughs> Indy. 
the, I played, I can't, maybe it was the first or the second generation when a lot, right up until I was going to a conference and I get on an airplane and this kid in front of me hears the music and he pops up over the top of the seat and he goes, oh, are you playing Pokemon? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, how many have you caught? And I'm like, seven. And he's like, I have 93. And I went, I'm picking up this game. And it's just, <laughs> it was like ruined. But now, you know, now that I've got, you know, a seven-year-old running around, you know, I've still got my, for, you know, credit to Nintendo, my Nintendo DS, not like a 2DS, like a, the original DS still works like right. perfectly. And yeah. so, you know, we're playing through, uh, which one is it? Diamond and Pearl, you know, yeah. one of the others right now. So uh, it's, it's that's just one of those that I'm like, I was so frustrated that I was getting destroyed by some, you know, a kid that I like didn't put it down for years. Mm. <laughs> right. So yeah, I think those are good examples of of um, of of super successful licensed games, and it's a combination of really good quality. Um, uh, super faithful to the the core experience of the the license and and um, uh, and then also being able to leverage an existing video game audience that was already there. At the end of the day, the the, the golden rule is you still have to make a good game. That is always the end of the day rule. Yep, exactly. Yep. Um, that uh, that. Uh, rule can be countered with um, new platform uh, and um, inexperienced audience. So, so all right. Well, uh, so, so here's a question. What IP right. did you just, there was someone's making a game out of it and you're like, this is going to fail, but it did good. Has there ever been any instance of that or? I, um, I know I don't, uh, I, you know, I, I don't oh, go crap. into that kind of progress. Uh, uh, I, I don't go into that prognostication type of thing with with licensed games. You hear about that stuff all the time. Like, uh, um, uh, so um, let's see. So there, there's a lot of opposite things. Like, um, uh, remember when the Matrix was hot and they were bringing out video games and they were yeah. going to bring out uh, Matrix Online? Oh, I was God. thinking, wow, that that might be a really cool game. And then, <laughs> And it just wasn't. Um, <laughs> it just uh, wasn't. You know. It wasn't. Uh, and, Bullet and, time. Uh, um, and then the uh, um, uh, also the the whole idea that the Okowski brothers had of having kind of the um, movie cartoon uh, game experience that were all wrapped up into each other. Um, that was a super compelling idea that that uh, that um, uh, failed in in ex its execution because. It required a huge time investment from all of its players to really um, enjoy the, the the whole macrocosm of of that 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 uh, that IP, and so that was a that was that was a difficulty there was was if you really wanted to enjoy things, you really really had to spend the time to play the game and to watch the movie and to watch the cartoon and experience the website and, 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 you know, just really, really get deep into that. And the number of people that, that really, really get deep into that rather than just have, wanting to have kind of a light experience to take up a little bit of their time is a, uh, um, uh, always, always reduces the amount of people that will engage. I have, I have an example for you, Andy, and it's actually one of the games John worked on. I never, <laughs> <clears throat> no, I mean, this is good for him. I never expected the license. Actually, I'll go back further than that. I never expected Puzzle Quest to work, mm -hmm. much less a licensed version of Puzzle Quest. And they were, you know, huge hits. Yeah, so, that's such yeah. a good game. My wife and I used to fight each other in that all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I never thought that would. Uh, when I first saw that come out, I was like, this is stupid. No and one's my, and my wife is not competitive at all. <laughs> She's actually in the other room. I'm saying that. But <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, look, babe, there's leaderboards in Beat Saber. Now we can compete against each other. <laughs> yeah, that's the quest guys. Um, you know, I, I I know the D3Go guys yeah. really well and, and they're they're super, super good to work with. No, and those games are awesome, but yeah, that that was one that I looked at and said, 
ah, this, is, this isn't gonna work this isn't going anywhere what are they doing and, that's funny yeah. so just so now she sticks her head out the door and she goes like this to me and what did i say and i said what did you say she said i said i was gonna kick your ass <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did she? No, she hasn't. She's not that good yet. <laughs> but I was like, so I got, I got it hooked up. I got it hooked up, and I played one song. And she's like, let me try. And I'm like, okay. And then so she's like six times in a row. And she's like, no, no, just one more, just one more. And I'm like, come on, give other people a chance. Yeah. Throwing shade at your wife is not always a good idea. Just, just saying. She, she'll just I, spend so much time. <laughs> she'll beat me at it. <laughs> My wife and I have the very same thing going on. You know, we go on vacation pre kids and went, you know, if you hear yelling and screaming coming from our room, we're not fighting, we're playing Mario Kart. And so um, just just understand that. So <laughs> where have you seen, you know, the, just the, the inverse of that last question? Where have you seen right. the these IP partnerships go completely sideways? Right. Um, gosh, uh, so I've seen, you know, several that I can't talk about, but, uh, um, uh, in general, it, it comes back to my drawing, right. Where, where, um, uh, the, the, uh, the game is so far outside of the core experience of the IP that, uh, um, it, it just doesn't, uh, it, it just doesn't work with the audience. Right. And so. So uh, those that that's that's the really big failures is when when a, a developer comes in and says, "Oh, I just want to slap your IP on top of this other game that I have a really good feeling about," um, but that <laughs> game and the uh, uh, and the IP just are like oil and water, and it's just it, it you know people who approach the game who are super fans of the IP uh, see that game and go, "This is the the thing that I I." was expecting um then that's that's a that's a big fail there um uh other failures so um the the best thing about being a, a licensor i gotta tell you is that i'm not responsible for my developers burn <laughs> right? so, so um uh so you want to take five years to make this thing you go ahead you take five years to make this thing. You want to increase the amount of people who are working on it. You go ahead and do that. You make the best game for me you possibly can, right? So that's 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 the best thing, right? Is is I'm not um, counting your burn. I'm not checking how many people you're you're uh, you're working with. I'm not looking at your expenses. All I'm seeing is that I want a finished game that represents my brand really really well, right? So if you come to me and say, "Hey, uh, we're going to be three months late," I'm all right. That's <laughs> fine. You I'm not your publisher. Months. I don't care. <laughs> exactly right. Um, uh, so the problem with that is that that if you're a developer and you're footing your own bill um, uh, to make this IP uh, a focused game, uh, and you're working in this box, right? And uh, the box is this big, and all you can afford to build is a box this big. Um, you are going to be constantly um, uh, tempted to, to make this little box bigger to fit the bigger box of the, the, the IP uh, and add more characters or add more settings or have these other mechanics or um you know maybe the the ip has you know a lot of monsters and you want to have more monsters you want to have the fan favorite monsters but you also want to have the, the team favorite monsters right and so so um uh, it's super super easy when you work with an ip um as a small developer to overscope and i've seen that you know uh fairly often is is um is you lose sight of exactly what you can afford to build uh and you end up not just promising the licensor more than you can actually develop uh uh um, deliver but you also you also lose sight of what what your your ability to deliver is and so you you end up you end up kind of getting to an end of a rope that you hadn't realized you were getting so close to and then suddenly you're you're 
you're in financial problems, right? Uh, and you still have three months to go, or you still have five months to go, or six months to go before you realize the game that, that you have. And if you built the game at this point, the licensor already is expecting this size of game because this is what you promised now. And now you can only deliver this type of game. It's going to have all sorts of holes and um, and uh, uh, jagged pits in it because you're ripping things out. Um, you thought that you were going to have, say, 64 different enemies, and now you can only do 25 different enemies. And so there's uh, tons and tons and tons of repetition now. And the quality of the game is is starting to slip because of, of that that fact. Uh, you went from a 40-hour game to a 20-hour game to a 15-hour game. Um, so that's that's really really a uh, um, uh, the uh, where things can go just completely wrong. And on top of uh, that, and, sometimes you've still got a minimum guarantee that you have to pay whether you ship right. the game or not. Yeah, so you you end up having to bankrupt yourself uh, and declare bankruptcy so that you can get out of that 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 type of of uh, bargain, right? So so uh, um, there's there's a, a lot of a lot of danger in that. And so um, that's why going with a publisher who is trying to, to, to work with the licensor is, is just always better for the bottom line. The publisher will oversee you. Um, they'll have a, uh, experienced people that will know something about scope, not always a firm idea of scope, but, uh, um, but at least some idea of scope and, and some idea of, of what you should be um, uh, um, executing on, uh, and the, you know they'll pay you. If you're footing the bill yourself, uh, then um, then you just have to really, really be super, super transparent with yourself, with your team. who are all gonna want to just do all sorts of stuff because you know uh, I don't know if you've worked in the game industry before, Jay, but uh, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty new. Yeah, yeah it generally. Generally, people below the, the, the guys in the, the C-suite have no idea how much they cost altogether. <laughs> and so, so uh, they don't understand the cost of office space. They don't understand the cost of, of their own salaries, of, of, um, of the licenses that, you, they're, that you're using in terms of hardware, like FMOD or... or you know, or um, you know uh, unreal or uh, unity or or any other thing like that uh, and so uh, they don't understand the cost of adding another monster they understand in terms of time oh we're gonna have to spend an extra two weeks to make this monster but they don't understand the, the dollar amount that that that's going to to reflect and so so uh, and this is a, a a piece of advice that that I, I try to share as much as possible with, with people who ask me about the game industry is the first thing you need to understand is the economics. And if you understand the economics of, of behind behind building games, you'll understand 95% of all the weird decisions that, that come down and blindside you. Uh, and, you know, for years and years, I was in the game industry as a designer and um and the, the project director or somebody would make this like all-consuming direction change and it would make absolutely no sense whatsoever right and it's like okay everything needs to be focused on this thing over here um or we're cutting level three or something like that um, <laughs> and, um, we're and, cutting uh, single player <laughs> and, and uh um and so the uh, you know the, the reasons behind that are generally economic, um, rather than um, you know, I, you know just uh, oh my kid told me that level three would be bad or something like that right so so uh, um, uh, so understanding ec the economics behind uh, development, understanding what everything costs, um, understanding how much things cost per month, uh, really really kind of focuses uh, things. And, and gives you a, a sense of insight that uh, will allow you to, to to really kind of ride out things that would, would really, really upset you otherwise. To be fair, a lot of the crazy shit that you see come in those idea sessions also come from the C-suite because they oh, yeah. have no idea on the technical side 
and the, you know, especially the marketing people that need an extra bullet point for the box or, or, or right. whatever, yeah. they have no idea how much, I don't know, say a multiplayer campaign would add to some right. of this stuff as well. That's why you have to have a really good producer that can look at both parties and go, you're crazy and you're crazy. We're yeah. not doing either one of those. Yeah, it's it's being being transparent with the economics of things. I think is is uh, helps everybody communicate better on on the same level and understand the impacts of their requests. Yeah, it's like okay, we can do that, but it's going to take you know three extra weeks and it's going to cost this amount of money and you know it's right. it it's a very um, transparency and just being honest with everybody around is generally the best practice, but it rarely ever happens you know, yeah. in, in yeah. the real world. In general, um, you want to be transparent because you don't want to be the no guy, right? Yeah. Um, so if, if you're always the no guy, no, you can't have multiplayer. Uh, no, you can't have an extra character. No, you can't have, um, you know, uh, five more monsters. Uh, you know, no, you can't have this feature. No, you can't build this puzzle, you know, is, um, uh, you know, with, without understanding the economics, it just feels like, you know, you know, some whimsical, capricious god that uh, keeps slapping you down and, and all of your good, uh, the people's good, good ideas, right? Being transparent about those things, understanding the the the, the uh, impact of those requests um, on on that economic level uh, and on a personnel level, uh, you know, uh, if you can, if you're the producer and you can you know, expand on that and explain why these things are a no, then then it's not a no so much as can't. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And, and people under, uh, have to understand that. And the, the, the core of video game development is that you're always building in a box, right? You're building in a box of what the technology can do and how much of that technology can you accomplish. And, um, and so uh, pushing outside that box is, is money. And uh, and you have to constantly think about that. Um, yeah, there's, there's no way to to get beyond that. All right, so we're 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 getting towards the end of of our time here. And mm -hmm. John, thank you so much for doing this. If no one else, if you've got a question, throw it up in chat. If you don't, I've got a question for you, John. All right, give me the game that you want to see made. Budget is not an option your dream licensed game <laughs> my dream licensed game oh geez um i you know uh so two months ago um i, I would have brought up the book dream park do you know what dream park is did you ever read it it's uh no, I, um, I read that. Uh, stephen barnes uh and uh larry niven book uh based in the 80s uh, so when I read this book back in the eighties, when it first came out, um, it's this, uh, it's super cross genre, right? It's, it's a, a book about, uh, it's, there's a mystery, right? So there's a mystery part of it. Um, it's about a, uh, kind of a Disneyland esque type park that caters to LARPers, right? Um, to, to put it in, in terms that everybody knows at that point in time, LARPing wasn't a thing. Right, is in, and so there's this uh, um, really interesting, and I can talk about this for a long time. Uh, uh, circle of, of of economics that that go on with this to make it all kind of viable, and um, and so I was always always very much enamored with with this book. And I always thought I'd make a great movie. I thought that it'd be a great experience. Uh, and then uh, a couple months ago, I was you know, proselytizing it um, to one of my coworkers. And he said, oh, well, do you have that? I'd love to read that book. And I went, yeah, yeah, I can, uh, I can, I can pull that book out and, and load it to you. And so I thought, well, I better check the book out because I haven't read it since the eighties. And, um, and I reread it. It has, um, you know, basically at the time, the typical thoughtless misogyny of, <laughs> of 80s books um uh you know the the thing that uh, that people complain about a lot where you know the the authors are constantly talking about female physiology 
um, uh, you know, uh, how people look in their clothes and and uh, and things like that. And it's like, wow, this is super embarrassing to read. And, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I guess I'm not going to lend this to my my friend. The, I think the core idea is really uh, good still. Um, uh, and uh, and I'd love to see see that the whole thing uh, come into uh, to being the whole parks. It uses AR basically to uh, um, to enhance the LARPs uh, that that are going on. So basically, the uh, the 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 actors, um, uh, you know, the, the the characters in in the the, the game uh, are all being led through an adventure. Um, in kind of a holodeck type of, of, uh, of atmosphere using mostly AR. They use holograms a lot. Holograms never became the thing that they thought they were going to become. Um, and, uh, um, and then everything gets recorded and filmed and those that, that recorded and filmed in kind of a separate movie. And also the whole game becomes uh, available to smaller kind of holodeck experiences. Uh, and that whole um, and that that gaming uh, experience, of, uh, uh, like a uh, I want to say RPGA, but people won't know what that is. Um, uh, so a uh, role playing game association points, planeswalker points, kind of thing. Um, uh, that uh, um, uh, that allow people to, you know, go from the farm league into the semi-pro league and then finally to the pro league where the dream park is and then it all cycles back and forth right so it's super aspirational there's there's lots of stuff going on and uh, uh i think that you know if we're talking about no expense uh, uh matters i think that that, that would be a, a super super cool experience uh as long as you take out all the um unadulterated 80s misogyny um <laughs> Crap that uh, that 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 is the book is kind of steeped into. The, the, aside from that part, but no, that's awesome, and that's what yeah. I love. You know, the, one of the things that I absolutely love about working with licenses and being at the position that that we are in the industry, where you know you can feasibly look at someone and say, "Oh, you're right, that would make a cool game," and then you can actually start making the phone calls to see if you can make that happen. Is mm -hmm you know, we can have these conversations where it's like, what if we did this game, but with this IP and it's just fun to, to hypothesize yeah. until someone does it and then does it badly. And then you just have to, you know, go in your corner and cry because that, that opportunity is now wasted. Uh, right. But John, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, you know, uh, always remember, you know, uh, you know, a license, a license gives you less money to do the thing you want to do. Right. Because you have to pay those minimum guarantees, or you have to pay that royalty, and so um, the you know the, the bucket of money that 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 um, uh, the, the bucket of money that that uh, you have to spend on your game ends up shrinking a bit. Um, uh, and so, so uh, I you know depending on the license, it can be super super expensive. Um, those aren't my dogs; those are somebody else's dogs, uh, and uh, um, <laughs> or. Uh, you know, it could be fairly cheap. It really depends on on uh, on the license that you, that you work with. Uh, the smaller licenses, they're easier to get. They can be cheaper. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, but they they won't give you the 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 UA kick that that uh, a bigger license will. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, it's just always just always remember that a license a license gives you a smaller bucket to achieve the thing that you want. And very frequently, um, uh, that that little bit of extra cash will have gone really, really well during the polishing phase. <laughs> you'll you'll look at the end and go, "Oh yeah, we we might have could have used that for something." But yeah. Still, I love it. All right, John, thank you so much. You know, for coming on, it's awesome. I'll you know love having you around just to bounce ideas off of it, go back and forth. So and you good are absolutely stories too. Good story yeah, exactly. You're no, absolutely welcome back whenever you want to come back. All right, that sounds fun. All right, um, maybe maybe I'll can I can pop on with uh, Tom Biscaglia and we can oh talk about um, me me uh, and you and Tom 
that's like yeah. indie we we could do about 12 hours of the 12 days of indie you as know, long as just yeah, enough alcohol yeah. and, then, and, and then then you and i could speak after yeah that. exactly <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Speaking of twelve days of indie, indie, do your thing. Uh, twelve days of with... indie. It's a, it's a thumbs up, fun to listen to. Awesome, thank you. Uh, twelve days of indie starts November seventh, and it's a twelve day long marathon to raise money and awareness for Toys for Tots. It's going to be on my channel on twitch.tv slash indie. But the indie game business has a slot. What is our? What day is our slot? I should, I, probably put that, I, should, I should probably put that in my calendar. I'm guessing it's Wednesday or Friday. Is it our usual slot? Let me look here. I actually have the calendar right here. Uh, let's see. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I don't see it. <laughs> we were supposed to be in it, and maybe we will. It depends oh, on... Oh, yeah. Oh, no. We are at noon PS or EST on Wednesday the 14th. So our regular time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, 11, 14. That's ours, not, not and 11. I, I can also confirm with you now that we have 20 codes from Star Traders Frontiers from our friends over at the Say Brothers oh, uh, that, just, that just hit my inbox Bam. that we will be able to give away throughout that week too. And we've got, you know, a lot of, a lot of great companies have put in and, and donated some codes and stuff. Um, the microphone, that we yeah. So yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. It'll be it's right. our sixth year, I believe. Sixth oh, year in a row. And speaking of that, we, um, John, you were here for a milestone. This is officially our six month birthday. <laughs> the um, in, happy in to the, be part of your six month birthday. Uh, the the pop up that at the very beginning of the show said you know Indy has been sub subbed for six months now so congrats well, that, that came across yesterday that doesn't mean it's our six month show that just means no. we've been affiliate for six months we're, we're oh really yeah I thought that meant we had been on um, whatever no that just it's means six months that it's my six month sub anniversary is what it is and actually it was yes. yesterday but. Close, Close enough. enough. Anyway, thrilled that we can do this. And thank you, Andy, for all that you do to, you know, basically run this. And um, yes, that's it. I'm done. I have nothing else. All right. Anything else you want to say, John, before we're out of here? Uh, endings are always hard. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> endings are just so, so hard. So thank bye. you guys for having me, Bon. And, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you later. All righty. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody.